So it's communication complexity, and it's a very basic and well-established notion in complexity theory. It's one of the simplest ones, as uh, complexity notions go. Uh, as you may know, computational complexity is a very useful notion in the sense that uh, there are really important things that we want to know about it, but there is basically nothing that we do know about it. Uh, communication complexity is different in that there are lots of established facts about uh, communication complexity of uh, certain problems and uh, more and more that we know about it. And that's basically because it's a simpler notion. So you, or many of you, so the typical situation is that many of you know a lot about communication complexity and the rest of you have never heard of it, so I have to kind of say things that will not be new to any of you and hopefully uh, around the second half of my talk I will be saying things that uh, uh, coming from a uh, joint research with uh, ex-student and colleague of mine, Mert Shalam, who is now a PhD student at the uh, University of Washington, and that I assume will be new even to those, half, those, those of you who know about the basic facts of uh, communication complexity. So communication complexity is this scenario where uh, there is this guy or gal, usually called Alice, and he knows some input X, and there is this other guy called Bob, he knows some input Y, and they are far apart. Typically, this guy is on the moon, so they can only communicate via telephone line, but that's very expensive, so they don't want to say much. And they want to compute something that is related to both X and Y. So the simplest scenario is that they want to send messages back and forth, and at the end, there is some function they want to compute, and the function depends on both of their inputs. So the simplest way, of course, is uh, Alice sends over her input x, and Bob computes the function, and there it is. So how do we uh, charge for a scheme like this? It's called, by the way, it's called the protocol. Protocol tells you, tells them what to do and how to compute this function. And we are not interested in their local computation. So we assume that Alice and Bob both have access to very powerful computers and they can compute anything they want. We only charge for messages sent back and forth. And basically there are two things we charge for goal. Compute this function with, and there are two competing goals here, not necessarily competing, but potentially competing goals. Uh, small number of messages, it's called rounds. How many rounds do they need? And small total length of messages. By length, we assume that they communicate in bits, for example. So every message is just some sequence of bits, and we want them to send short sequences. So the total length is how much they communicate in total. That's the more traditional measure. And this is an additional measure. We also want them to communicate in as few rounds as possible. So Trivial 
protocol is the one that I mentioned, Alice sending over all her input to Bob and Bob computing the function. Uh, it uh, has one round and the length is the length of x. So no matter what the function is, you can do this. So this is kind of the trivial protocol. You cannot save on one round, just one message sent from Alice to Bob and Bob will know the answer. Uh, but of course, this is really bad. I mean, if the communication length is as long as the entire input that Alice has that we considered a very inefficient protocol and we want to, uh, want to do much better than that. Okay, so here are two well-studied uh, so what is the communication problem? I give you the function f and then depending on f you have to say something uh, uh, meaningful about how complicated it is to compute f. So if you concentrate on just one of the two measures, this will be the total length, then you can say that okay the total communication complexity one needs to compute this particular function is that the optimal protocol who does compute that function uses that much uh, communication. If you have these two goals, then you will say things like, okay, if you have like 10 rounds to send messages back and, back and forth, then you need this much. If you, are, if you can use 12 rounds, then maybe a less communication is enough. Uh, okay. So it turns out that this is very well established and for most uh, problems actually there is not nothing much better than you can not, nothing much better that you can do than doing the trivial protocol and this is certainly true for these two most well studied problems first is equality where x and y say just, you can take them from any universe uh, just to uh, make sure that we understand what the length of a message is. I take it from 0, 1 sequences of length n, and then the trivial protocol has length n. And so, and the uh, function f, so e, q, n of x and y is 1 if x equals y and 0 otherwise. So that's just a binary function saying that, OK, are the two uh, strings equal? So the way you should think about this is that there is an operation manual, 200 pages in hands of Alice and also another copy in hands of Bob, but they always run into some problems and they don't agree on what to do and they figure that that might be because the operation manual they use is different. So they want to compare them. So one way is Alice just reading out the entire operation manual to Bob over the phone and Bob checking, yes, yes, this is what I have. And that's very inefficient, but it turns out there is nothing best, not, nothing better. So turns out that uh, no protocol computes this function in less than n bits communicated. And the other one that I want to mention is uh, intersection. So now x and y are subsets of some basic underlying set of size age of size n called age and so f of x and y is 1 if x intersection y is not, so they are disjoint and 0 otherwise. So that's the disjointness function. We call it this jointness n. So that's another function 
It also, so the story behind this, if you want the story, is that Alice and Bob are very busy, but they want to date and they figure out if there is, a day, there is an evening in the next two years when they can actually meet because they are free together. So Alice knows when she is free, Bob knows when he is free, and they want to figure out if there is a point when both of us are free, both of them are free. Uh, and the same story. No trivial protocol uses n bits. I mean, to send over x, you have to send n bits. There is nothing better that you can do. So it's not it well studied up to a point that there is nothing really interesting that you can ask. It's not exactly true. There are some uh, open problems left in this field, but uh, not too many. Uh, so, what makes this interesting is a low randomness. So, randomness sometimes helps. We have no idea if it really helps in computation. So, that's probably the most important open, one of the most, well, P equals NP is the most important open problem in uh, computational complexity, but probably the second most important and the one that is, well, uh, has any chance to be solved in the near future is whether probabilistic approach randomization really helps. Is there any problem that is easier to solve if you allow random coin flips and 1% of error than without this? So we can ask the same question about communication complexity. And now the answers, I mean, to this particular question is known. Uh, it turns out that a using randomization does not help in this problem and it does help a lot in this problem. So what do I mean by randomization? I mean a protocol where Alice and Bob are allowed to use random input, random sources like coin flips, and they have to come up with the correct answer for every pair of inputs with some very high probability, say 99%. So they come up with an answer, and the answer must be the correct answer, in, no matter what their input is. So the protocol I do not want is an equality protocol that says that, no, they are not equal. That's true for 99% of the inputs. Most, if you take random x and y, they are not equal, most likely. So that's not a good protocol because the inputs don't come random. But a good protocol is such that no matter what the input is, the answer is correct with 99% probability. So, uh, and there are two sources of randomness they can use. So random protocol. Uh, probability of error is less than, say, 0 0.01. Of course, if you have an error, have a protocol that has probability of error one third, then you can just repeat that a couple of times, take the majority output, and then you can reduce this error probability to anything. So if you don't, you're not interested in constant factors, then what I write here doesn't really matter. Any, any small constant is fine. And that should be true for any given pair of inputs. So for every x and y. Uh, but where is the randomization coming from? And there are two, two possibilities. The realistic possibility is that A and B use coins. And the well, more restricted version is that A uses coins, B is deterministic. That's a bit more restrictive, but not much of a difference. And there is an unrealistic version where A uh, and B use a common random source. So there is like a random string written in the sky. It's like the activity of the, you know, solar 
flare activity or something. Some random string that is readable to both parties, but uh, it's not considered a communication. So if they read this common random string, then it's for free. And it turns out that that helps a lot for, uh, okay, first two things. Turns out that these three models are basically the same. So, uh, almost the same. The difference is order of log n, where n is the length of the input. And anything that is linear in the length of the input that we consider long, that's the trivial protocol uses that length. But anything that uh, is logarithmic, we consider that short. And it turns out that the difference between these two, these models are very small. It turns out that, uh, so these help basically equally. And it turns out that uh, for, for equality, you can do the following thing, which uh, is a one round 10 bit protocol with one over a thousand error probability. So you can do uh, extremely well. Instead of like linearly many uh, bits sent, you can get away with just 10 bits sent. Well, it's a bit of cheating because from now on I use this common random source model. Uh, but you can translate that into separate random coins model and you only lose a logarithmic length. It won't be like 10 bits, but it will be logarithmic number of bits. So that's easy to do. Uh, um, by just uh, take a random function and all is sends f of x to Bob. So again, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm taking an entire random function and I'm not charging for it. That's the common random source. Common random source provides this function. And well, so what does Bob do? Bob announces that x equals y if what he receives is the same as f, f, f y. Bob says x equal y if f of x is f of y. So there is an error probability here. If x really is y, then there is no error. But if x is different from y, there is a chance that although it's different and we took a random function, for some, there is some random chance that f of x is f of y, meaning that there is a probability of error, which is exactly 1 over 2 to the 10. So we are good. And the uh, result of Kala, Ina, Sundaram, and Schnitger. So it's a theorem that any randomized protocol for disjointness uses omega n bits. So this theorem tells you that no, there is nothing you can do 
with the disjointness. In fact, uh, the trivial protocol is basically optimal. If you want to do better than a constant times n, then your error probability will be enormous, basically one half. OK, so that's kind of well established uh, background for uh, uh, randomized uh, communication complexity. This uh, lower bound with regards to the disjointness function is uh, very widely used to uh, prove lower bounds, not only in communication complexity. So you can uh, take a reduction from one function to another and then use this. Uh, this is, by the way, a hard theorem to prove. But once you proved it, you can use it to prove lower bounds for other functions by via reduction. That's not so surprising. But it's also used in other fields of uh, complexity theory. So this communication lower bound is also used in a lot of uh, lower bounds for streaming problems and other computational problems. I mean, the idea is that uh, take another computational problem and somehow uh, take parts of uh, the computational apparatus as like players and establish that in order to compute what you really want to compute, they have to communicate a lot. And in order to communicate a lot, you have to use a lot of time or a lot of memory or whatever. I don't want to go into that. I'm just saying that this is a very useful theorem that is basically telling how useful communication complexity as a model is. It, it, it establishes the bottleneck problems for a lot of other complexity um, questions. I mean, outside computational complexity, uh, outside communication complexity. It turns out that communication is really the bottleneck for a lot of other computational problems. So, OK. So from now on, I will concentrate on the disjointness of small sets. So it's the same problem, but restricted. So x and y is uh, subsets of a universe that we call H. And say H is of size n. And we still want to compute this function, that this, this jointness of x and y. But there is a further restriction at x and y are both at most m, which is supposed to be much less than n. Well, if it's certainly x and y cannot be bigger than n, but maybe if we restrict them to be much smaller, it will be easier to compute them. And indeed, it is easier to compute them. For example, the trivial protocol uses fewer bits now. If uh, so. The trivial protocol, remember the trivial protocol was always sending over x. So if y can, arbitrary, can be arbitrarily big, still x is at most size m. So uh, well, the number of possible subsets that he can have or she can have is uh, n choose well, at most m, n choose m plus n choose m minus 1 plus so forth. And so in order to send over which one she has, she has to take the logarithm of this, and that many bits will suffice. And that's approximately uh, m times log n. So imagine m being much smaller than n, then this is approximately n to the m, so this is approximately m times log n. So, yeah, you, we already saved some. It's not linear. But we also have a lower bound, even for a probabilistic protocol. So, any protocol solving this uh, sends 
omega m bit. And that's because if I further restrict the problem and I'm saying that not only the size is small, but I promise that these sets are actually subsets of, si of a subset of age of size m, so they are just using the first m element in age, then naturally their size cannot be bigger than m, but you have an unrestricted problem there. So there you can apply this uh, lower bound by Kalaina Sundaram and Schnitger and prove that, well, you need m bits to send. So it's somewhere between m and m times log n. And it turns out that there is a protocol by um, Hastad and Wigderson uh, that solved this problem in order m bits. So indeed this upper bound is, is, is uh, this lower bound is optimal. We can, we can find a matching upper bound, not V, but Hastad and Wigderson did. There is a protocol that independent of how big n is, so imagine n like being huge, doesn't matter, you're still using just uh, m bits, constant times m bits, and you decide the disjointness of x and y. And so I give a Uh, properties of the hostad wigderson protocol. So what properties does a probabilistic protocol have? Well, the most important property is length, and that's order of m. And that's optimal. There is nothing you can do better because it's lower bound. And then number of rounds that's uh, order of log m. So it's not too many rounds. And then there is uh, error probability. The error probability that they prove is uh, constant. So this is probably because they didn't uh, look at it very carefully, I mean, the, a small adjustment of their uh, a protocol can be, we can make the error probability less than a constant by, without losing these parameters, but this is what they prove. And the output is one bit. They disjoint or not disjoint. You don't really learn more than that. And what I really want to speak about in the remaining few minutes is an improvement over this protocol where, well, the lengths we didn't improve, so that's for a reason. I mean, this is optimal. But the number of rounds went down from log m to log star m. So log star is, uh, tells you how many times you have to take log to kill the number. So it's the inverse function of 2 to the 2 to the 2 k times. So log is a small function, log star is much, much smaller. Every reasonable number, like the number of elementary particles in the observable universe, you apply log star to that and you get something like five, so it's not. Uh, error probability is a uh, little of, so super polynomially small, it's order of 
1 over little o of 1 over n to the c for all c. So the error probability is not just the constant, but much smaller. As I said, you can do the same claim here by a little bit modifying their protocol. But the most important difference between these two is here. So instead of saying, yes, they are disjoint or no, they are not disjoint, we actually produce the entire intersection. And that's uh, really more if you think about it. I mean, so if the answer is yes, they are disjoint, then it's not more. Then the intersection is the empty set. But if they are uh, not disjoint, then it's better for Alice and Bob if they know what the intersection is, what are the days when they can actually have a date, rather than knowing the fact that, yes, in the next two years, there will be a date, which is good for both of you. I mean, that's not that useful. And the point is that we didn't lose in the most important parameter. It's still optimal. The lengths didn't go up, but we improved on all of the other fronts. Uh, and all of this is optimal too. There is no further improvement possible, for example, for the number of rounds. So we can also do t rounds and order of m times log t of m bits. So this is supposed to mean the t times iterated logarithm. So one round and m times log m bits, or two rounds and m times log log m bits, or three rounds and m times log 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 m bits, you get the idea. And of course, this is just a special case of this. If you go up to log star with t, then you get log star m rounds, and suddenly this is a constant. I mean, that's the definition of log star, how many times you have to apply log to make this a constant. And uh, and yeah, it's still a small error probability. And, and this all, for all given t, this is optimal. So if you fix that you have only 10 rounds to communicate, then you do actually need constant times m times 10 times iterated log of m bits to send. So you have to pay for using just 10 rounds. I mean, this is exactly how much you have to pay. So this is optimal. I, there's not uh, enough uh, time to give you all the details of the lower bound proof, so I will basically skip that. Uh, but the construction is not that complicated. Actually, we have to start with the construction that Hostad and Wigderson used and improve upon that. And without, I mean, just improving it to log star rounds is really a simple matter. And then there is another uh, clef clever trick that you have to use to get to the intersection. So, Okay, so how do you do, um, how does Hastad and Wigderson uh, protocol work? And this is how it works. So again, remember that we are using this common random source model. So sometimes I will use, okay, take a random function from here to there, and then I won't charge for that. And that random function will be known for both Alice and Bob. And when you, uh, when I say cheating, it's a little bit of cheating, but not much. As I explained here, it wouldn't matter because uh, uh, by just a logarithmic additional uh, uh, bits of complexity and no additional rounds, by the way, the same number of rounds, but a little bit longer first round of communication, you can turn it into a more realistic model where the random source is only available for Alice and Bob is deterministic. And I sh should want to say that it doesn't really change anything 
because these are bigger than the slogan? Well, I cannot really say that because, well, this n was the length of the input. The length of the input is unbounded. So if n is like exponentially bigger than m, then adding log n doesn't really, adding log of the input length doesn't really, uh, okay, again, there are too many n's. So this m times log n is the input length. Adding the log of this is basically adding log m. Well, you wouldn't notice that because this uh, order of m is anyway there. But it also means adding of log log n. So if n is like exponentially bigger than m, then it's okay. But if m is like, n is like twice exponentially bigger or doubly exponentially bigger or three, ex three times exponentially bigger, then suddenly this, uh, this uh, small additional cost will be overwhelming. But as long as uh, n is just like exponentially bigger than m, then that cheating is not really a cheating. Okay, so uh, let's use this board now. So well, maybe I shouldn't even erase this because here is Alice, he knows the set X. Here is Bob, you know, the set Y, and the, so this is the, I'll start with their zone protocol, is uh, L is sending a random set uh, R1, and R1, contains x and so x is a subset of r1 and it's in the universe age and it's random so what does bob learn from this set bob will know that well if the x and y intersect it must be within y intersection r1 the other side other part of y so here is x here is y so there is a random set here r1 so we don't know if this part exists but we know that this part of y will not be useful in finding intersection point so he can kind of forget about that and he can think from now on that his input is not really y, but y intersection R1. The rest he can forget about. So that's exactly what he does. And then he sends over a set R2, where R2 is, uh, so his new y, so he will consider his input y to be the intersection from now on. And this new y should be contained in R2, and that should be otherwise a random set in the universe. And he's sending R2. What does Alice do? Alice will replace x with x intersection R2 for the same reason. He will know that if there is an intersection, the intersection should be with this part of x, not with the rest. And they do it back and forth, and eventually they, one of them might get the empty set in this process. And if that happens, he pronounces that, well, the two sets were disjoint. There is no potential left for an intersection. There are lots of problems with this protocol. First of all, how long does it take to send a random set containing x? It takes a long time time because imagine the universe is like huge, x is small, a random set is this huge set containing x. Uh, if you 
want to send this over, you have to send as many bits as the size of the universe, which is unbounded and much bigger than the, what the trivial protocol would require you to send anyway. So that's really bad. So here comes the common random sourcing. Instead of sending these sets, they send an index. They imagine that this common random source is just a list of random subsets of the universe. So there is a list, first random subset of the universe, second random subset of the universe, and so forth. And these are independent random subsets of the universe. So one way to find a uniform random subset is to look for the first in the list that, that qualifies. Some of the list will not contain X. Those are not good to send. But the rest are good, and if you take the first in the list that satisfies this condition, that's a good thing. So just send the index. Don't send the random set. Just send that in this commonly available list, the first set that I can send is set number 127. So how long does that take? You just have to send the index of that set. Now you don't know how big that index will be. But typically, it won't be too big. It's a random set. You have this small set X. So the probability that a random set contains it will be exactly so expected length of first message is uh, basically size of x, which is less than m. Why? Because each random set contains x with probability 1 over 2 to the, the size of x. Let's, let's say that x is exactly size m, then each random set contains x with probability 1 over 2 to the m. It's a random set. It, has, it contains or doesn't contain any element of x with probability 1 half. So it contains all of them with probability exactly this. So typically, there will be 1 in 2 to the m sets that will contain the whole thing. So the first one is approximately the index of the first one. The, the, the size of that index is approximately m bits. If you, take, if you allow for n plus 100 bits, then there is an overwhelming probability that, that, that that's enough, n plus 100 bits uh, will be able to describe a set that actually contains x. So that's okay. I mean, this, the size is approximately m here. But there are other problems with this protocol. First of all, I didn't tell you how it will conclude ever that the two sets intersect. So this is how it will conclude that the two sets intersect. If uh, the protocol is too long, it goes over for, I mean, they already sent like, okay, so end, end of the protocol, empty set, then x intersection y is the empty set. If any of them gets the empty set in the course of the protocol, they stop. Uh, or they used up, 1000 m bits then they stop and declare that x intersection y is not the empty set so this is where the error probability creeps in it is possible that they are disjoint but they can use up 1000 m bits and still didn't re realize that so this is what we will uh, look here why that doesn't happen often so we don't have to worry about uh, x and y that are not disjoint if x and y are not disjoint and they just send these random uh, sets back and forth and they will never arrive to the empty set because the intersection will always be there and after using up a thousand m bits, they stop and say that the two sets are not disjoint. But 
If x and y are disjoint, so x and y don't have any elements in common, then what will happen? So take a random set containing x, and that will intersect y in an absolutely random subset of y. There is no restriction there. I, choose the, I chose a random set containing x, so the only condition is that it should contain x. But that doesn't say anything about elements in y. So if x and y are random, then this new y is just a random subset of y. And that random subset is approximately half the original. At high probability, in every round, their sets will be cut in half. So, without doing the computation very precisely, it tells you that really in log m rounds, they will have and have and have and in like log m plus 10 rounds, most likely uh, the sets will be empty. And how many bits did they use in this log m, uh, two log m rounds, for example? Well, in the first round, they use them bits, but in the next round, it's just the size of the remaining set. But that's already halved. So the, the size here is approximately m half. And the next one will be, well, it will be also m half because this was m and now it half. But the next one after that will be m over 4 and m over 4. So it's an exponentially decreasing sequence. So even though the first was m, the total sum is also constant times m. So you use a constant times m bound only log m rounds. To make sure that you really do not use more than log m rounds, you can, uh, for this halting hot, condition, you can say that, OK, if you reached more than 10 times log m rounds, then you stop and declare that they are not disjoint also. OK, so, so, so this is the trick of the hastad Victorson protocol. And it's a nice protocol because it really tells you that no matter how big the universe is, you can do uh, a protocol that uses no more bits than absolutely necessary, which is basically the size of your small sets. But how, OK, so. The remaining zero minutes, I will tell you what the improvement is that we did. But I'm afraid I will just have time to do the uh, less uh, important part of improvement, which improves the number of rounds. Turns out that uh, it is useful to consider biased random set. So in this protocol, we assume that there are random sets, a sequence of independent random sets of the universe uh, written on the wall. And we just refer to them in a, in a, in a message. We send that, OK, uh, we use uh, random set number 17. But it was a uniform random subset of the universe. And you can uh, fine tune this protocol, so fine tuning. You take a p random set. The p random set contains elements with probability p. And imagine p to be much less than 1 half. So these are smaller random sets. There is an advantage and a disadvantage of this. The advantage is that this decreases much faster. If the two sets are independent, x and y are disjoint, then anything containing x will be still at this p random set in y. So instead of most likely halving y, it will most likely go from the size of y to p times that. And if p is much smaller than 1 half, you gain a lot. You don't need logarithmic number of steps to kill every element in y, you will have fewer elements, fewer steps. And so that's the advantage. Where is the disadvantage? 
Yeah, so in this computation where we said that any random set contains x with probability 1 over 2 to the m, that will turn into 1 over p to the m. So the length of the message that you send is approximately m times log 1 over p. That's really bad. You don't want to make p small because then it's bigger than m, in the first message at least. But later on, when the size m became shorter, you can afford a little overhead. So maybe the length of uh, the messages won't go down like this exponential sequence, like in the hostad wigder zone, halving all the time. But, well, it's okay if it, like, uh, goes to 99% of the previous one. That's also an exponentially decreasing sequence where the sum is proportional to the biggest item. So in our protocol, we change p with p being one half in the first round, but then p very rapidly decreasing. And we set it up in such a way that the length of the messages will go down not quite as fast as in the hostad wigder zone protocol, but fast enough to make sure that the all messages all together will be just constant times longer than the first message. But using this force of uh, reducing p to make sure that the set sizes go down much faster. And the advantage here is uh, the way that you multiply m with is the logarithm of 1 over p, but the size goes down with fraction of p. So there is like an exponential difference between how much you can gain and how much you lose. And every time you already shrunk your set to a smaller size, suddenly exponentially bigger possibilities appear. And therefore, basically, in every step, we go from a size to basically a logarithm of that size somehow. I mean, that's not very precise, but this is what is going on. And that's why the log star appears then. Now, it's enough to use log star rounds and achieve the same goal. And it's also a simple computation that you can do that. If you, want, if you know that you want to uh, do it in 10 rounds, then the first message will be also with a smaller p, so it will be a little bit longer, but that's fine. The next messages won't be longer, and altogether, you just pay for the first message, basically. Uh, so what I really wanted to tell you was how to do the finding the intersection, which is much trickier than, than this. And the thing is that if you have an intersection, x and y, and you don't know how big this intersection is, but this protocol will always get sets that contain this intersection. So you cannot just send random sets containing this intersection because the size of those finding a random set won't be easier and easier in every round. So you really have to do something uh, tricky and okay, so I don't have time. I will just say that uh, instead of, uh, of uh, sending the index of that random set, you will send some information about that index that is short, just right, like a random hash function of that index. And then that will be enough for Bob to figure out which random set you possibly meant. Because yes, it's a random subset containing x, but he knows that it will contain a large subset of y2. If they, they already figured out that the intersection is quite large, then they don't know what the intersection is, but they know a lot about those random sets containing uh, x because it must contain a big portion of y. I mean, this is just a very high level trick, but that's, uh, I, I think this is the most important trick to do the, the uh, finding the exact intersection. Thank you.